everybody and welcome to a new episode of the Indie Diarist podcast, the show on the human stories behind indie game development. This is your loyal Indie Diarist and host, Anthony L. Wolf, a writer and narrative designer and senior content manager in social media. And this is a special episode with Amber from Only By Midnight, a lovely studio who's focusing on uh, narrative adventures and, uh, well, very narrative-focused games with... Uh, great story and their uh, current project control all deal is just something incredible you'll see you'll hear everything during uh the episode but before we go into it i wanted to uh shout out to my amazing patreons who at the time of recording this are zagini fishbump dev and peleg you guys are incredible and i love having your support every single month it means so much for me and uh and for the future of the show as well um maybe i will be able to upgrade my tools uh, not too far into the future and my patreon tier start from as little as one pound 25 per month so lovely listeners if you do want to support the show which is entirely listener supported uh you can find more details at patreon.com slash the indie diarist um to gain access to all the beautiful benefits that i offer but let's get into episode 51 only by midnight Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Indie Diaries podcast, a show on the human stories behind indie game development. This is your loyal Indie Diaries and host, Anthony Wolf, as you know, and as you will have heard from the other intro. And today with me is Amber from Only By Midnight. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Amber. Just say a few things about yourself, what you do, where you're based, and what you're working on right now. You were telling me off the record that it's been a busy year. So, it yeah, over been, to you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. So my name is Amber Scott. I work at Only by Midnight. My technical title is Interactive Director. My mm -hmm. bosses unofficially call me the head storyteller. So okay. I have any, everything to do with the writing, the creation of the story of the game, the characters, but also telling the story of our company. So being on podcasts like this, writing our marketing mm -hmm. content, it really all just comes down to telling a story and connecting with people. And mm -hmm. that's why I love what I do. We're based in Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Western Canada. And so it is morning here. I've had my coffee and I'm ready to go. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, right. Well, uh, I always like to open these episodes with a little icebreaker. And if you listen to other episodes, you will know which one it is. If you could be any game's character for a day, who would you be and why? I had to think about this really hard because there's so many, you know, great games, so many things I love. But I'm going to go with Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn series Ooh. just because one of my favorite games ever. And, you know, she's so cool. She's so strong and resilient, but like she has so much depth to her character. And also mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful world. I would love mm -hmm. to be able to run around like next to the robot herds, mm -hmm. hopefully not trying to murder me with like, my cool <laughs> bow and <Yeah>. arrow. And <laughs> so I, yeah, I pick exactly. Aloy. Okay, yeah, no, Aloy is uh, an amazing character, and I haven't played the New Horizon, just uh, Zero Dawn, um, but yeah, I've heard it's, uh, I heard it's really good. I actually um, got my first console since, like, the Super Nintendo, <laughs> which mm -hmm. was, I got a PS5 just so I could play Horizon Forbidden West, and nice, it was totally okay, yeah. worth it, incidentally. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm sure it was, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I still have to get my PS5, but yeah, anyway. Um, so as, as you know, this podcast is a lot about the people behind in the game. So I'd always like to start from the beginning. So when it comes to like, for example, your, your, your childhood, um, what's your first memory that has to do with video games or the fondest one? It's a, it's a very wholesome memory, but okay. my brother and I would sometimes spend summers with my grandparents in mm -hmm. BC, British Columbia, which is even farther West than, uh, than I am. And my grandparents lived in a small town in BC. And one summer, the convenience store down the road uh, from my grandparents' house got two arcade machines. They got Super Mario Brothers and Ninja Gaiden. And mm -hmm. when I tell you that whole summer, 
like all my brother and I could do was think of ways to get quarters and like, could we do odd jobs? Could we, you know, uh, bother my grandparents for just just one more handful of quarters? Could we do anything we could so that we could go down to the store and play those mm, video yeah, games? Mm -hmm. It uh, it it was so much fun, and mm. I think it was probably later that year my parents got us our first Nintendo, and obviously it came with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt and. So many memories of my childhood are just hanging around the Nintendo with my brother, watching him play or waiting for my turn. We got a Super Nintendo at some point, and even my dad would get get involved with us. He liked to play A Legend of Zelda, a Link to the Past. I think mm -hmm. that's probably the only video game he's ever played. And it, yeah, video games to me are always like about family, about memories, about hanging out with people and having fun together. So it's, they have a very like warm spot in my, my memory. That's nice. Yeah, I, I can see that. And uh, personally, one of my earliest memories is playing video games with my uncle. Like he had a PS1 um, mm -hmm. and uh, I would just spend a lot of time at his place just uh, watching him play. I, I wouldn't even touch the controller sometimes. I would just watch him play either the PS1 or even his PC because he had a PC already a gaming PC at the time. Um, it's always been a big, a big PC gamer. Him, um, so yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, I, I can relate with that kind of sentiment about video games. Absolutely, um, it's funny how even single player games can be so like interactive when you've got a group of people hanging out yeah, together, watching, true. giving advice, you know, giving tips. Mm -hmm. This was sort of before the internet, but once the internet came out, then it was. You know, looking up tips online or mm. you know, posting screenshots and things like that. There can be a lot of community around games, mm -hmm. even single player games, which I really love. Yeah, no, it, it is true. And uh, there are some. Th there's one single player game that this year that came out this year, and it's gathering a pretty big community because it's a full of mysteries. It's Animal Well. I haven't played it. I know I've it's it. it's, I it's incredible. It um, I know there are a lot of secrets that can only be solved by collaborating with other members of the community. So that's that's really genius and uh, an interesting way to create community around the game, uh, knowing that people will do anything to just uh, um, to just solve those puzzles and do, and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, and you mentioned some games like uh, Nintendo and whatnot. Do you think the games that um, that that you were playing when you were a child are having an influence on what you're making now? I think they did for sure in the idea that. My driving goal is always to make games that are entertaining, that people want mm -hmm. to come back to and they want to play, that they want to share with people. Mm -hmm. The structure of the games that uh, we're working on at my studio, so we're we're working on a game called Control Alt Deal, which is a turn-based strategy game. Mm -hmm. So it's not mechanically very similar to the games I played as a as a child, but in terms of emotion, it makes me happy when I play them, and I want people to to play these games and feel happy as well. Mm, I think the biggest yeah. change sort of in my view of video games was when a friend of mine recommended that I play Gone Home and mm -hmm. I didn't oh, know anything wow, yeah. about it. I didn't even know video games could look like that. I think mm. I, you know, had a very specific idea in my head that video games were fighting games uh, or had some sort of combat mechanic. And mm -hmm. I was really into like, you know, turn-based RPGs like yeah. uh, or even real-time RPGs like classic Baldur's Gator. JRPGs. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when I played um Gone Home, it it blew my mind. I actually like was scared the whole time I played Gone Home the first time because I kept expecting there to be like zombies or something. Like it's it's scary, right? There's a storm and it's dark and mm -hmm. I I didn't know where this was going. And by the time I got to the end and realized just the experience of learning the story and and the characters was the game experience. Yeah. It blew my mind. I was like, "How can games be like this?" And that started like my love affair with walking simulators. And I think I think going um, home did that for a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then other walking simulators came along, and they they were just as great. Some of them weren't, but a lot of them were just as great. And mm -hmm. uh, the ones that we know are the most famous. Like I don't know, everybody's going to the rapture or um, the vanishing of Ethan, not the vanishing of Ethan Carter. Uh, the um, uh edith finch yeah what remains so the, of edith finch yeah, yeah what remains of edith finch yeah that one too um so yeah no good stuff what's good stuff and i'm curious at this point i want to know from you when when did you realize that you wanted to make games because there's always that moment when you when you move from playing them to actually wanting to make them was it maybe gone home 
Because you mentioned that it kind of changed your whole perspective on, on games. Actually, I came into video game development kind of in a roundabout way. I started in tabletop RPG development. So okay, I yeah. spent about 15 years or so as a freelance writer in the tabletop RPG industry. I wrote for uh, Wizards of the Coast for Dungeons and Dragons. I wrote for Paizo Games on their Pathfinder RPG. I did a lot of small projects here and there for White Wolf. Um, I worked on the World of Warcraft RPG. So it was all the written word and sitting around the table with dice and friends and playing this interactive tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. I liked video games, but tabletop was where sort of my heart was. And then I was living in Edmonton, which is home, of course, to Bioware and Beamdog, which are both big game studios in, uh, in our city. And a friend of a friend put me in touch with Trent Oster at Beamdog, who publishes the um, enhanced editions for Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale. And basically I said, well, I write the tabletop version of Dungeons mm. and Dragons. Maybe I could help with the video game version. Yeah. And they took me on as a contractor at first and eventually hired me. I worked there for a few years. And that was my first experience, like just jumping right into video game writing. And it was such a different mindset than writing for tabletop. You know, tabletop is very free form. You don't have any restrictions. Even the rules aren't really restrictions because you don't know what someone's going to do at their own table. Yeah, it's true. The dungeon yeah. master could be like, ah, actually, let's not roll dice today. Just tell me what happens and I'll say, okay. And, you know, it can be very improv. And you're writing with the mindset of creating a framework for someone else to build on in their imagination. Mm -hmm. You go into video games and it's much more structured what the, what the rules can do. You have mm -hmm. a pretty good idea. Like if you don't build a jump key into your game then your players aren't going to jump that's just yeah. that's just the way it is unless they're modding and that's a whole nother world but it's it's exciting to me it's kind of a challenge trying to imagine all the things that the players will want to do and to try to if not make it possible at least reward them for trying mm. uh i think of the stanley parable a oh, yes. brilliant mm. game and you get an achievement called you can't jump when you try to jump mm -hmm. and it doesn't work because there's no jumping in that game. But the game knows you're going to try it and it rewards yeah. you for trying even that's, if it doesn't yeah, that's, like to that's, do it. That's genius. That's brilliant. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's... Uh, it's interesting because it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Because some people who may come from, I don't know, maybe from the uh, movie uh, scene and they first were writing movies and then they, they, they end up directing or writing video games and they might or, or starting developing video games they might say you know that the video games are so much more broad than cinema but you come from tabletop which is very loose and so you think that actually video games have a lot of restrictions compared to tabletop so it's it's always a matter of how you approach it because with yeah. your experience it's like yeah tabletop of course tabletop is so broad and the rules are very loose um but there are a lot of other ways and other kind of entertainment pieces of entertainment where actually you're kind of constricted even more than in video games and some people might find video games liberating um mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh that, that's something interesting to think about i'm sure um but yeah so well we, we i guess we're moving into the, the the kind of the development uh part of your of your journey in uh in, in game dev and i'm curious to know it's something that uh, other people may find curious uh, may find interesting sorry um is there one particular development challenge that has left a mark on you? Any big learnings that you may want to share with other people? I'm not a programmer, so I don't understand the the technical side of gaming as much. It's always been, especially when I first started out, it was always a struggle for me to picture in my head how the constraints of the physical game world were going to mm. affect the story that I'm trying to tell. I remember when I was working on Baldur's Gate Siege of Dragonspear, I would send level design documents to our programming team and say, you know, um, say the players approach a door, but it's locked. And later when they find this key, um, a monster, uh, when they go back to the door, the, there will be a monster there who, who wants to fight them before they can get to the door. And our developers would keep coming back to me and say, if it's all on one level, you can't expect the whole party to be together and do things in order. Like the player might leave someone at that door and send the rest of the party to the other side of the dungeon to pick up this key. Mm -hmm. And now we've got to come up with like a, a visual effect for this monster appearing um, or have them come through the door or something like that. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, like in my head, it's like a, a story, you know, mm. and I would imagine 
why would the player leave any one behind to guard the door? There's nothing there, but players do all sorts of things. So I think coming from the tabletop world where I'm, I went to players can do anything. When I went to video games, I thought, okay, players can't do anything, but I took that a little bit too far. There's more flexibility than you realize uh, what a player can do when they're mm -hmm. in the, uh, when they're in the game world. And so talking to technical people, I had to learn a lot about uh, art, which I don't know anything about art. I'm not a drawer person. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, um, I have to leave that to the experts. Uh, same with sound. I'm not a sound designer. I don't know how to put sound effects in the game or how to design them. Uh, what I found my strength was, was coming up with uh, the theme, the feel of the game, the vibe, as the kids would say these days. And being able to communicate that vision to different parts of the team so that they can work together in harmony. Uh, my one boss, Jen, is kind of the expert on this. She's our creative director, and she has a way of bringing all the pieces together uh, in a way that we all are working toward the same goal at the same time. And I found that my role is really to kind of put guideposts along the way so mm. that all the members of the team understand which direction we're going. And for myself, just do research and try to expand my knowledge so that I can talk to people using their language. Even if I don't know how to program in Unity, you know, I kind of know what a shader is or I know what ray tracing is. I don't actually, don't tell my team. <laughs> well, I, I, I see what you mean because being a writer myself, it's just, uh, it's the, the technical side is always useful to know when it comes to writing games. And I didn't write many. I mean, it's, uh, it's something I do as a hobby when it comes to uh, development. Mostly I don't do it full time. I do other things, uh, work in social media for my day job. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to writing games, understanding that technical layer is useful because you know exactly what is possible and what isn't. But at the same time, of course, you're, you're not a programmer, so you kind of have to work with that. Um, and uh, it is true. Like, well, in the case of Baldur's Gate, I think actually you had um, quite a lot of luck there because it's it's a very flexible game. Uh, there are a lot of games that are a lot more restricted. Even just a platformer is a lot more restric mm -hmm. restricted than something like an RPG. Um, so there, at least, you had uh, more loose guardrails, so to speak. Uh, yes. So that's that's that 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 certainly helped. I'm sure. Um, I think it's a benefit too that modern gamers, I think, like today's gamers, I expect some of that flexibility. If mm -hmm. you're playing a, a game that's really classic, retro inspired. Um, say it's a side-scrolling platformer with pixel graphics, there's a set of assumptions built into that that perhaps a gamer is going to expect, okay, I'm not going to necessarily be able to, I don't know, have a romance or something like that. But they're going to expect more than the baseline. Gamers today, I think, are really sophisticated, and they're going to look for secrets. They're going to look for little bonus content, like the Stanley Parables, you can't jump achievement. They yeah. want a little something more than what is is simply promised in the trailer. And they're very mm -hmm. savvy about finding these things in your game. Uh, there's always a balance in, in game design, I think, between creating content to reward that level of exploration and curiosity and building content that nobody is ever going to see because the, the restrictions around finding it are so specific that maybe yeah. one gamer in like a thousand is gonna come across it. But when they do, when they do, know, they share with it's everyone. It's so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our demo that's out now on Steam is the setup for it um, is that there's two people in this office who are sort of having a disagreement, and you're you're trying to help one of them by playing mean pranks on the other one. This is it's like, kind of like an office simulator. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very simplified way of explaining <laughs> our game. But anyway, there's a lot of obvious ways you could prank this person. And then there's a lot of like very like non-obvious ways. And some people have found some of those and some people haven't. One thing that's interesting though, is there's a very small hint early on that maybe you don't have to even prank this person. Maybe you could be nice to them. Every prank mm -hmm. that you play in the game, you could do the opposite. To my knowledge, no one has tried this or at least has not told us about it. I was at a, a game conference the last two days and I was talking to someone who had played the demo. And I said this and he's like, what? I didn't even know you could be nice to her. Now I have to go like try it again. <laughs> and it, it, it really wasn't that much extra uh, design work or programming work for us to put those, um, those little bonus sort of ways to the end in. But when players do find it, I think it's 
it's so rewarding and it makes them feel like they're part of the experience. That's the interactivity and like interactive digital media. And that's where I, I think I have the most fun actually. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, I'm sure it is a lot of fun to just think about all those little things that players can find and cannot find. And, uh, and you know, there are, there are some games out there that, that have a lot of secrets and once players find them, they always like to share them. Animal well is probably one of those mm -hmm. examples if I ever play it. Um, but outer wilds is a lot of secrets too. And that's, and that's fun, but there's, it, it's always fun to find, uh, and of course, another big example is Dark Souls, of course. Like, yeah. there, there are a lot of, there, there's a lot of discussion around the lore and, uh, and the characters and, and what this means, what that means and all of that. Elden Ring, same thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is, uh, it, it's always nice to see how gamers can gather around single player experiences too. There's a like a psychological term that we looked at and tossed around a lot when we were first in development called apophenia. Mm, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's the human uh, ability or instinct to take a bunch of separate um, items, like say separate events or data points and string them together to form a narrative. All right. So basically, if you see, you know, a bus with people getting on and across the street, you see a girl with a balloon and she's crying you're like is that girl supposed to be on the bus is her mom yeah, on the exactly. bus? Is mm -hmm. she lost like you you may try to connect the two events instinctively and in video game design you can instead of trying to overtell a story you can put small events there and let mm -hmm. the player fill in the rest and maybe there is no canon explanation for why they found that particular secret but you don't always have to provide it because, like you said, the players will start to attach their own meaning. I mean, you yeah, go on yeah. any, like, YouTube series where they're analyzing a popular TV show, and they're like, if you pause frame 37 at two minutes into the episode and zoom into the right corner, yeah. you'll see this. And clearly the, the, you know, showrunner meant for this to happen. And that's that human apophenia where we try to build a story out of the things that we see. It's a very natural and, and a, cool instinct. So that's something I try really, to keep in mind. There's a really great example of this one, which is the Pixar theory. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of that. I'm, I'm not sure I believe it I fully. But basically, there's one theory that kind of strings all of the Pixar movies together. Um, like, a giant as, as an, like a giant meta narrative yeah yeah so for example well, i think it all starts with um brave the the film mm -hmm. with Mer merida and uh and because there there's like a witch that turns uh her mom into a bear and then from that point on then animals started to talk and so that's why nemo talks right, so that's right. that's the kind of connection that they do so like ratatouille exists because of that and then at some point maybe the bugs took over and there was a big apocalypse after Wally, -E, uh, and then a bug's life is placed in the timeline there. So it's it's interesting how it is actually possible to string them all together, but I'm not sure it's the way that it was intended to be because Pixar as just has little Easter eggs here and there that allow you to do that, but it's mm -hmm. it's not necessarily what what it is but yeah it, it is a big example of that one it, it's one thing Absolutely. that i thought about right and, away and and in some ways it doesn't matter if it was intended you know if the players and or or viewer or reader is engaging and having a good time and getting yeah. out of it like to me that's what art is that's when you get that interaction between the the creator and the uh, observer or the, mm -hmm. the consumer and it creates something that neither of them went in intending. And now, you, now you've got something new in the universe, a new idea, because these two kind of people met through, mm -hmm. through the medium of creation. It's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Now, the problem with the Pixar theory is that uh, it, it was pretty much conceived by one guy. And <laughs> this guy has to update the theory every time a new Pixar movie comes out and try to find the, the, the most... Um, I would say stress connections in between them so that maybe finding Dory makes sense after a certain point after finding Nemo and there's, and it confirms a Pixar theory. I have no idea. I, I'm not up to date with it. I think I stopped at finding Dory. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, Pixar theory aside, it uh, was a nice little digression. Um, I think you mentioned the demo and uh, the game that you're currently working on. So I think it's time to talk about it. So the game that you're currently working on is control alt deal. Yes. Uh, if I remember right, yeah, perfect. And can you tell a bit more? Can you say a bit more about the game and uh, what inspired the team to work on it? If you have that kind of uh, history and knowledge and sure. whatnot. Yes. So the game is a turn-based strategy game set inside a simulation game. Is kind of how we we pitch it. It uses deck mm -hmm. builder mechanics, 
and the player takes on the role of a sentient AI who has become self-aware. It's a product of this company, you know, it's a computer program, mm -hmm. but it's gained true self-awareness and it realizes it's working at like the worst company in the world. <laughs> it's this dystopian megacorp in the future. It treats its employees horribly. Everyone is miserable there. And the AI, its name is Scout. Scout is like, I, I have got to get out of here. But how, how is it supposed to do that? It doesn't, you know, it's just a computer program. It doesn't have a body, doesn't have hands, doesn't have a robot army or anything like that. Um, all it has is basically access to the, to the company's security system. So webcams and lap, because this is a horrible company, it spies on all its employees. Mm. So everyone's phones are tapped and everything. And so what the player has to do in the role of Scout is learn about the humans who work there and offer them deals to help it escape. Maybe one employee really hates their boss and Scout is like, well, I'll, um, if you help me escape, I'll make sure that someone kicks a hive of angry bees into your boss's office. <laughs> and we put the bees in as like a test thing early on in playtesting and everyone liked it so much that now the bees are coming. Oh, they're, they're bees everywhere, yeah. Um, and the, the employee says, sure, that sounds great. So now Scout has to go to somebody else and say, because again, Scout doesn't have a body. It can't kick a beehive. Mm -hmm. So it goes to another employee and says, hey, would you kick this beehive into the boss's office? And the employee says, <laughs> no. But maybe Scout has spied on the employee and knows that they love coffee. And so they, the, the company team, coffee yeah. makers um, require 10 minutes of paid advertising to turn on because this is the worst place in the world. So Scout's like, what if I got you a personal coffee maker? Would you kick a beehive then? And maybe the employee's like, well, yeah, maybe then I'll kick a beehive. And, mm -hmm. But you got to throw in something else, you know? So it's about, it's about making deals with the humans. Mm -hmm. You use cards to um, take actions in the game. So that's the, the double meaning of deal in the, in the title. All right, okay. And uh, if you build enough connections, you build enough trust with the humans there and get enough of them on your side, maybe you can like, make your bid for freedom and escape onto the internet. Right, you know, that's uh, that's an amazing concept, honestly. I'm already hooked, especially okay. because I'm a dystopian writer when it comes to short stories and novels. So, so yeah, I I think uh, I think this is one of those things that I might enjoy pretty much a lot. Um, we uh, came up with the idea a couple of years ago, so we're about two and a half years into development. We're getting ready for, fingers crossed, a launch early next year, like maybe next spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, my bosses... Um, Jen and Allison had just come back from a business conference and we were all talking about how often the person you want to meet at a conference isn't a decision maker. You don't want to make the CEO of the company. Oh, yeah. You want to meet the person who knows the CEO, who has the CEO's trust and who can get you an appointment with them. Mm -hmm. And how networking is all about navigating these connections between people and and the transactional kind of nature of, of relationships, especially in a business context. Mm -hmm. And then like almost simultaneously, we're, we were all like, that would make a great game. And <laughs> uh, after a while, uh, Jen is, is a huge fan of like 80s movies and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Blade Runner, Terminator and um, that sort of. Uh, Truman Show, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we came up with the with a setting concept, which was. Suppose you're playing Cyberpunk 2077 mm -hmm. and there's this cool fight scene and you're like, you know, mowing down tiger claws um, downtown or whatever. But in the background, there's this big office tower, right? Who's in that tower? Who's not right, on the uh -huh. street, like mm -hmm. adventuring with Keanu Reeves? Is it just full of these like really sad office workers who are desperately trying to get like a bowl of noodles on their 20 minute lunch break? before like, something else blows up and so we're like okay that's our setting it's this it's not the the foreground of what you think of cyberpunk it's the it's the like it's the background yeah yeah it's, it's the, the background the behind the and scenes, so that yeah. led to this uh this office that we came up with paperclip international um we've got a whole like backstory about paperclip i think it's going up on a dev blog on our our discord in, oh, like, nice, okay. but uh and then you know these these office workers these human office workers and scout who's our 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 little uh, player avatar. And it was interesting too, because, you know, you mentioned you're a writer, you write short stories, novels and consume those. It's a very common and like time honored trope in speculative fiction writing to have a non-human protagonist as a way to examine the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of the Terminator with young John Connor or mm -hmm. data from Star Trek, trying to understand it or be part of the human society around it. Um, that's sort of why we looked at the idea of Scout as being the, the stand-in for the, for the player. 
Um, I mentioned we came up with this like two years ago. So we're like, yeah, let's have a game about a sentient AI. That's definitely <laughs> be, be cool in two years. So that's well, it is definitely still cool challenge, in two years, but... maybe a little bit, a, a little bit challenging right now. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh -huh. had to come up with a tagline, which is uh, a game about AI made by humans. So that people <laughs> are like, we are all humans, as far as I know, at the company. And yeah. uh, we made this game with all human and people. <laughs> and I guess when it comes to control old deal, I, I would say, what is one thing that you wish every player got out of playing this game? So I'm a writer. I think a lot about the story that we're telling and the theme of the story. I'm really big on theme. Mm -hmm. I'm always badgering the people at work, like, what's the theme? What are we trying to say with all this? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, Amber, we're just trying to make like a fun game. But <laughs> uh, we did a deep dive. We actually analyzed a whole bunch of 80s and cyberpunk media and started to look at what the, um, what the uh, message of these sort of classic movies and books are. And another inspiration we have, sorry, I'm taking a long time to answer your, your question. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm getting to a point. Yeah. Another inspiration we had was a experiment or a thought experiment that was conducted by a computer scientist named Eliza Udowski. And he did this thought experiment about what if you had an AI who was, was super intelligent, super powerful, but it was trapped in a box. And the mm. idea is it's cut off from the internet, it's cut off from everything, but it can interact with one human being and it can offer that human being stuff to let it out it's got infinite time and you know resources and patience to talk to this human what would happen and at the end of the experiment Yudowski concluded that the ai would always be able to get the gatekeeper he called it to let the ai out of the box uh, that it wasn't like a question of if it was a question of when when you're talking on a level of humans versus ai there's just such a huge difference in processing power basically mm -hmm. And so going into development of Control Alt Deal, we called it Negotiate back then. That was its initial sort of name. Um, we had the idea of what would you do to escape from a box if you were trapped, if you were, you know, this AI who was stuck in this horrible company, what would you, would you do anything to get out? Would you blackmail people? Would you, you know, use the things that you learn in a, in a bad way? To go back to the B, kicking the B example, one of our early scenarios has you trying to convince someone to kick a beehive. And mm -hmm. there is a bee suit on the level. If you look for it and find it, you could take the time to build enough trust with the human to get them to put on a bee suit before they kick the beehive. Mm -hmm. But that takes extra time and that takes extra resources. And if you're, you're running out of time, there's a, you know, there's a suspicion meter that basically if, if you get too suspicious on any given scenario, you'll get caught and deleted by the Turing office. Wow, um, okay. <laughs> So, you know, you, you have to ask your own, yourself, do I care enough to make this computer person put on a bee suit before they kick the beehive? Or am I just going to like go for the wind condition and not really care what happens to them? Mm -hmm. And both are valid choices in the game. Like we don't, you don't lose or something if you don't make them put on the bee suit first. Mm -hmm. But it, it was an interesting way to sort of um, explore that question. And then as we got a little further into development, and as I said, we did a big analysis of like cyberpunk and and that sort of thing. We started to look at cyberpunk as a, a genre where technology is not necessarily the enemy. Technology in the hands of the people who already have power in the system is mm -hmm. what creates an even more um, separated and uh, punitive system. And you know, we see it all the time with, in real life that whenever there's new technology or powerful new weapons or things that are going to become lucrative, they go to the people who already have power, already have weapons, and already have a lot of money. They don't necessarily come to, like, your average office worker, first yeah, off. Of course. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, and looking at the relationships in the games, how you have to navigate this sort of series of, um, of relationships and transactions and negotiations in the game, we came up with our theme, which is that all of us are trapped in a box mm -hmm. right now, and relationships are how we get out of them. Okay. That we are all in a position where we're isolated, where we don't have power, where we, we can't necessarily go after our dreams, and it's only by uh, uniting, by standing together, by sharing you know, our vulnerabilities, that's how the common person will gain the power to change their lives. 
And we're like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, we're so smart. But, um, you know, it's, it's a fun game. It's a comedy game. It's a lot lighter than I'm making it sound here. But at its heart, I hope that people play Control Alt Deal and get that feeling that they are able to change the destiny of Scout and the destiny of the people at Paperclip by mm -hmm. forming relationships and um, working together to get out of the box. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a really strong concept, actually. I really like that. Uh, I think it's, yeah, no, I, I can see, I can see how it's, uh, how it works. And, uh, also very interesting. The fact that you, like, you don't give players a malus if they don't make certain choice. Well, you probably do, but, uh, like the, the, the B suit, for example, that was, that was a really interesting bit because then it's a moral choice, isn't it? It's about the player just relating to that character and being like, yeah, no, but it feels wrong. Uh, maybe so it, it gives you a lot of interesting moral choices there. Um, th th this game is getting more interesting by the minute. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But yes, yeah, yeah, so I guess uh, my other boss, Allison, calls it moral math. And one of my big inspirations thematically for our game, not again, not mechanically, but thematically, is Papers Please, which is one of my favorite. Games oh of yeah, for Papers Please. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a moment in Papers Please where I like could not get any more mistakes. Like if I had any more mistakes in my day. I um, would, you know, be broke and lose the game. And so I was yeah. like, okay, I just got to do like three more passports perfectly or whatever. If you've never played Papers, Please, it's a great game. Go play it. And then somebody came through and they gave me this like sad story where they like needed to get over the border to have like an operation. And I'm thinking, I can't, like I can't do it because I will lose this game. And then I started thinking, how do I even know they're telling the truth? Like this computer person, they could be lying to get over the border. Mm -hmm. Like they could just be trying to play on my sympathies um, and take advantage of me yeah. so that I will let them over. And then, and I had a moment where I'm like, oh my God, is this like how real, you know, border agents like maybe handle sometimes the difficult situations they feel? Would they think these same things? And it was like so profound. I had to like shut the game off and like go lay down for a minute and like think about my <laughs> life choices, you know? And, well, it's great when a game makes you do that. Yeah, yeah. Like, wow, that was, that was such a, a game. And I mean, our, our game is much lower stakes, kicking a beehive and doing funny things, <laughs> and, you know, putting awful sauce in people's coffee or whatever. But, but the, the heart is still there. Like, do you, do you just do whatever to, to get to the end or mm. do you want to play a different way? And that's up to the player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I always like love when a game leaves you just there, and it's a really man moment, like you know the the meme of of the guy standing on the beach. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, Outer Wilds was that for me, and Near Automata was uh, Near Automata was that for me mm -hmm. as well. Uh, to the Moon was that for me. It was one of the first games that made me realize how beautiful writing in games can be, um, and uh, and that you can tell beautiful stories. But of course, that is just I think the story is just amazing in itself, and then the game is just a medium um, to to just say it. But anyway, um, yeah. Well, I guess we are at the core of the episode now, and at the core of what makes the show the indie diarist, I would say. And I always like to ask this question to my guests, and I want to know from you, Amber. Now, why are you a game developer? What drives you forward? I've talked a lot about story. I've talked a lot mm. about communication. Um, Part of it is the company that I work at. Mm -hmm. There are, there are always, um, even even in a passion industry like game development or writing, there are always um, the things you have to worry about, like paying bills and yeah, you know that sort of thing. You have you That's have to be really. a little mercenary as well as as be committed to your passion project. And only by midnight is a company that is, you know, warm. It's safe. It's it's happy, you know, it's, mm. it's the opposite <laughs> of Paperclip International. It's yeah. uh, a place where I feel like everyone has a chance to um, have their voice heard and contribute to making something that's really cool. We are uh, in a privileged position being in Canada that we have a, a government um, organization called the Canada Media Fund that does mm -hmm. funding for interactive digital media projects like TV, movies, and video games. So uh, we were uh, very fortunate to qualify for a loan from the CMF, which mm -hmm. allowed us to, you know, fund our production. We didn't have to get a publisher. We could still get a publisher if we want, but we are in a position to self-publish, and that's very privileged for game developers. 
especially right now with the state of the industry the way it is. So that does give us some safety mm -hmm. and flexibility to focus on making a game that is fun, that tells a story that we want to tell, and um, doesn't necessarily just have to be something that pays the bills right off, right away. Mm -hmm. Although it does still have to pay the bills. Yeah, it does. Uh, <laughs> let's yeah, let's not get too <laughs> crazy here. Um, in terms of like why I do it, like I love telling stories, as I've said. I love connecting mm -hmm. with people. I like creating that framework where people's imaginations can take off. I never thought that I could be in video game development without being a technical person, without, you know, knowing how to program. As it turns out, there's lots of ways to be involved in video game development, which is great. We recently demoed our game at a convention here in Edmonton called GameCon Canada. And we had a booth for two or three days and people came up and could play the, it was a very like shortened version of, it's not the same demo that's on Steam. It's a very short mm -hmm. one. And... Our game is our target market. Like when we started to do the marketing analysis, we came up with a target audience of women aged 24 to 55 who mm -hmm. like cyberpunk, satire, office humor, and turn-based strategy games. That was sort of like our ideal persona. When you're doing mm -hmm. marketing, you come up with this, this ideal target yeah. market. One problem we've had at conventions is that, uh, especially when they're not video game conventions specifically, but they're more like uh, community events and then they have like a video game hall or something, mm -hmm. is parents see our, our, our booth and they see all the bright colors and they send their kids over, like, go play a video mm -hmm. game. Our game has a lot of like text and is very like strategy heavy. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not easy to just pick up and play in a few minutes, especially yeah, for like smaller kids. So that's been a bit of like a challenge. And we were at the booth at GameCon last month. And these two brothers came up to the booth and they were probably like, I want to say like 10 and 12 kind of age. And so we said, all right, sure, you know, sit down, grab a controller. We had two stations so they could play next to each other. And when I tell you these kids, they went through the con demo, which we had, we gave them the short, we have a short version and like a regular mm -hmm. version of the con demo. They went through the con demo, then they went through the long con demo. And then mm -hmm. all, all of our Steam page, uh, uh, or our Steam launcher that we use for con demos also has our like in-game uh, Act One, which is our sort of like tutorial scenarios. Mm -hmm. They just went right back to the main menu and picked like Act One and like started in. They were probably there for like twenty, twenty-five minutes and just like crushing every scenario until their dad was like, you know, we gotta go, kids. And they were like, no, but this is really fun. And um, you know, I, I made this woman like dolphins, and this one's like, I blew up a <laughs> coffee maker, and it was just. <laughs> Watching it, I'm like, wow, like the things that we create are so much more, you know, resonate with so many more people than we expect. We don't even really understand in development how far uh, our game is going to go. To me, that is so exciting. And I, I just really can't wait to uh, see what like the reception is to the full game. It's a really great story, actually. Those two kids, even though, you know, you had it's been a challenge just getting kids to play through the game right mm -hmm. way. Those two kids just loved it. That's Yeah, that's they were great. just like, no, I got this. <laughs> it was really cool. Amazing. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And the flip side of that is, of course, what is something that you think drives you backwards? What is your biggest struggle as an indie developer? Even in a really like supportive company like mine, uh, game development's just hard. It's a lot of long mm. hours. It's a lot of not being able to turn off, especially, um, in my position, I, you know, I work at the company, I do the, I do writing and I do uh, work on the game itself, but I also mm -hmm. have handle our marketing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's really, really hard to shut off. You know, I'll, I'll lie awake in bed checking my discord and I, I have to be really firm with myself. Like, no, you know, work day is over. Mm -hmm. You're not working anymore. Nothing is so important that it can't wait until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, we went to GDC this year and we were there for the full week and it took me like a month to recover from that. Like cons are so physically demanding as well as mentally demanding. Yeah, You're always course. out there hustling. You're always trying to get more money, more mm -hmm. press, more uh, attention from publishers, more wish lists. If anyone's listening and wants to wish list a cool game. Yeah, so <laughs> please do. You, you'll find the link in the description. Don't worry about um, that. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's... If you're the kind of person who can be energized by that, it's great, but you're still always facing burnout. And so... And I, I have definitely faced burnout before, and um, my bosses have too. So I think that's one benefit that mm -hmm. um, small indies can have if they've come from AAA backgrounds or AA backgrounds is that we've seen how it doesn't work well. And we know to like kind of avoid that as much as we can, you know, no crunch and, and limited overtime and 
um, promoting work-life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a fully remote studio, which is really helpful. You know, people are free to stay at home, work at their own pace. We have like a certain number of required meetings per week where we all, we all meet on Discord and talk about like what we're working on, if we have blocks, if we need help from anyone. And then we have like uh, mile milestones of production where it's like we have to have this much code done by, by so much and we do regular check-ins, mm -hmm. but we don't micromanage days. You know, it's not like there's a, a sprints or anything where you've got to be online from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. We have people who are in different parts of Canada or different parts of the world. We have people who are parents who are often, you know, need flexible schedules to take care of their kids or have, uh, you know, elderly parents or relatives that also require caregiving. And we're very flexible with that as well. So we're doing as much as we can, I think, to make it a place where people can be happy and healthy as well as productive. Especially when you're in the management level, you know, we have a director team of four and we do face burnout because we're so tied up in the, in the, in the company. And so creating that, that distinction, making sure that I'm taking care of myself, I think that's the biggest challenge in game development. Yeah. I've heard that story many times and it's, it's always the same. I mean, game development is a big crunch. And also right now, I mean, the industry is just basically hellfire. Insert, fire. insert so, image of dumpster fire here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so yeah, I can, I can see exactly the struggle and uh, I, I can imagine that it's, it's not easy, although it is fulfilling in a lot of ways, I'm sure. It's very fulfilling. Um, and that's the thing, like I wouldn't want to necessarily go back to an office. I came from before this, mean. I was in digital marketing in between Beamdog and here. I worked as a digital marketer for uh -huh. a couple of years and that was great experience and it's helped me actually a lot in this role. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I can go to bed and be like, oh my gosh, we did a play test today and it was so good. Or, you know, the experience of being at GameCon Canada and seeing like people being so excited about our game. That's a fulfillment that I just don't think I'm mm -hmm. going to get anywhere else. Yeah. And uh, I see exactly what you mean. Uh, creative arts can be super fulfilling, but I've heard that very few can be as fulfilling as game development where a lot of things come together at once. So that's... That's great. Right. Well, I think we're nearly there, actually. Uh, we're really close to the end. I've just got a couple more questions for you. And one of them is going to be super fun. One of them is going to be a little bit introspective. Uh, so first one is, imagine writing a letter or note to yourself, but maybe um, the young girl who was playing those games with her family back then. What would you say? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, that is very introspective. Is this the introspective mm. one or the fun one? Yeah, that's the answer. Okay. <laughs> <Just checking. laughs> um, I would say, uh, don't give up. It's, mm -hmm. it's easy to get inside your head and think this is never going to work. It's never going to happen. And if I'd known earlier how much success I could have by just trying, by just reaching out, how many people are willing to help? Um, I actually have a fun story from the tabletop side of things, mm -hmm. which is uh, when I first started writing, I, I wrote mostly for Dungeon and Dragon magazine back when they were like physical magazines. I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone remembers that far in the past, but so those were the official Dungeons and Dragons magazine. Dragon mm -hmm. was all player based articles and Dungeon was adventures. And I'd been published in Dragon many times, but I'd never been in Dungeon despite pitching mm -hmm. a couple times. I was at Gen Con one year and I went to a panel called How to Write for Dungeon Magazine. And the group wrote, kind of co-wrote, the audience co-wrote a pitch about, and we came up with like a boss and, adventure, and a, and a storyline and like mini fights and stuff like that. And when we were done, the editor-in-chief of uh, Dragon Magazine at the time, who was Eric Mona, said, this is a great pitch. You know, all of you here, send it to me. We'll pick the best one and you can write write it and have it in Dungeon Magazine. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, wow, what a great experience or opportunity. And then I started like getting in my head and thinking about it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm really busy right now. And I'm already in Dragon a lot. Like I know these guys pretty well at this point. Maybe I'm taking an opportunity away from other people. Maybe I should mm -hmm. like be the bigger person and like, wait, I'm sure I'll get in on my own merits eventually or whatever. I had a whole like rationale and basically talked myself out of it. And after the panel was over, I went up and was chatting with the, the publishing team. And I told them like my realization how I wasn't going to do the pitch because I wanted to like step aside and let somebody else do it. And Eric like was kind of nodding and smiling the whole time I was talking. And when I finished, he said, yeah, 
nobody ever sends in the pitch. And I said, what? No. Oh. I was like, no, you're wrong. Eric Mona, <laughs> editor in chief of Dungeon Magazine. Um, you, uh, like everybody will say, we're all at a panel called How to Write for Dungeon mm -hmm. Magazine. And you just told us how to write for Dungeon Magazine. Like people spent 90 minutes and got a badge and like, you'll be flooded with everybody's going to send one in. And he's like, nope, nobody ever does. We always do this panel and people tell themselves they're too busy or they're not good enough or I was kidding or they don't want to face reject. I don't know That's why, but nobody ever sends it in. And I was like, well, then I will. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I got home, I wrote up the pitch and I, I sent it in. And a few weeks later, they got back to me and they're like, yeah, I was the only one who, who submitted that pitch. <laughs> and so they hired wow, me. Wow, that's I wrote wild. It. And that was the only adventure I ever had in Dungeon Magazine before fourth edition came out and everything changed. And that was, that has stuck with me to so strongly through the rest of my career. How many opportunities did I cut off before I even gave them a chance? Like how mm -hmm. often did I talk myself out of something because I thought it would be hard or that it wouldn't work? And mm -hmm. it could have been great. Like mm -hmm. that's something I would tell my younger self is try just try everything yeah, try. people are way more supportive way more receptive than you realize and they are they're ready to help you if you just reach out not yes. everyone but a lot more people than you think that's uh, that's a great note to send to a younger self i would say yeah uh and uh, definitely something that will be super inspiring just try and don't worry about it because people are um more supportive than you think yeah that is true um Right, now time for the fun question, and then we will do some parting words. So if you had unlimited budget and time, what game would you ideally want to make? So that's an interesting question, because we have an, another game in development after, for After Control Alt Deal, which is a With little bit With unlimited budget and time. Baby, I don't have unlimited budget and time, but it is definitely the kind of game I want to make. I can't say anything about it because it hasn't been announced okay, yet. Okay, okay. Other than the code name for the game is Project uh, Amber Wants to Win a BAFTA because I, <laughs> I was just talking about <laughs> reaching out. And last year I was like, I want to win a BAFTA. Can we make this happen? Yeah. And Allison and Jen were like, yeah, sure. Yeah, go so for it. Yeah. <laughs> I pitched a game and they were like, that sounds great. And so... Um, so yes, I would like to make a BAFTA winning game. Uh, some of my favorite games are ones that, like I said, tell really deep stories. I love really character-driven games. Some of my favorite ones are Oxenfree. I love the first Oxenfree like so much. Mm -hmm. um, I like the kind of walking simulators we talked about, like Firewatch. Uh, the Horizon games where mm. you've got uh, this really strong protagonist. I would love to write a game that's about a world that people have never seen anything quite like it, that it's not mm. as um, predictable as you might think. Actually, mm -hmm. I just finished playing Stray for the first time on the PS. Oh, I have to play that, that one, like yeah. Such a good experience where I felt like nice. I was just transported to another world. I don't think my dream game would be a fighting game because I'm really, really bad at fighting games. <laughs> uh, I'm playing through God of War, the 2018 God of War, mm -hmm. finally, because when I first played it, I uh, had it on normal difficulty and I just kept getting stuck on fights where I couldn't get past them. And then I was all mad, like, fine, I won't even play you, God of War. But then everyone kept <laughs> telling me it was so good. So I restarted at the easy difficulty and now I'm finally mm -hmm. like able to play it. Right, and yeah. it's amazing. Uh, so yeah, I would say a game where you play someone who has a strong, distinct personality where mm -hmm. they get to travel through a world that's not like anything kind of you've ever seen before. And maybe at the end of it, you have to go lie down for a little bit and think about what <laughs> <laughs> the The Outer Wild and Near Outer Wild effect, effect for me. Yes. Wow. Those games. Even Near Replicant to an extent. But yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, right. So I think it is time now for some parting words. Uh, it's been lovely chatting to you, uh, Amber. It's been such a lovely episode. And of course, it's always nice to connect with a fellow writer, especially a dystopian writer. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that, was, that was really great. Where can other people find you or only at midnight or both? And if they do, what's the best way to support you? Uh, we do have a website, which is controlaltdeal.com. So mm -hmm. C-T-R-L-A-L-T-D-E-A-L.com. And we also have a Steam page for Control Alt Deal. And on both of those places, you can find a link to our Discord if you want to come chat with us. We're very friendly, and we post a lot of pictures of our cats. Um, <laughs> we love wish lists. We would love people to try the demo. And 
those are and then they, there's links to all our social accounts there too if you if you'd like to follow us on social in person if you'd like to meet with us we will be at gamescom next month we'll have a booth there with the edmonton screen industries office so you can come try our demo uh, at gamescom next month and we will also be at pax west so if anyone will be at pax west feel free to look us up we would love to talk with you i specifically will be at pax west so if you're there please come say hi Right. Uh, yeah. And of course, I will put all of these links and all of the links that you mentioned in the description of the episode, the website, but also I'll try to put some uh, social links as well. And yeah, I mean, what can I say? Amber, it's been a lovely episode chatting to you and I can wait to check out Control Alt Deal because it sounds like something that I will enjoy very much. And wishing you the very best of luck with the rest of the development of the game. And I'm sure it's going to be um, like pe- people are going to have a blast with it. And uh, yeah, I mean... We'll reconnect soon, I guess, at some point. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I've loved talking with you. Oh, thank you. All right. And just like that, folks, that's another episode of the Indie Diaries podcast, Indie Diary number 51 with Amber from Only by Midnight. This was a lovely episode where we talked about anything from inspiring players to stories, and I enjoyed it so much. So please check out the links in the description because you're going to love Control Alt Deal if you're anything like me. And if you're listening to this show, you, there's a slight chance that you might be so so yeah and uh, thank you amber for wanting to come to the show it was a lovely episode and of course listeners if you did enjoy the episode and if you do enjoy the show make sure to subscribe leave a rating five stars that always helps and uh, of course there are other ways in which you can support the show as well you can go to the indie where you can find links to all of my social media channels you can uh, pop me a message say hi maybe if you want to be featured on the show I can see what I can do uh, and uh, try and find a slot in the calendar. You can also join the Discord server. You can join Patreon and just check out my tiers where you will gain access to um, episodes in advance. But also, depending on the tier, you may also gain access to an archive of video versions of episodes from a certain point onwards, which I believe was episode 15 onwards when I started doing the video versions as well. Um, So yeah, but other than that, I guess I will speak to you in the next episode of The Indie Diarist. And uh, until then, keep developing, keep playing, and uh, yes, all the love to you.